so we're back, I think. Um, a few people have said to me uh, some things like, why do you keep using um, all this newsprint? And then you keep saying that newsprint isn't worth any money. It doesn't last very long. And uh, so if you're going to do, if you really like your drawing, you have to redo it on either a nicer sheet of paper or a canvas or whatever. Why don't you just start there? Um, <clears throat> okay. Multi-part answer here is going to be... Um, Hi, Stellar. Um, and multi-part part answer is going to be that I don't know if I'm going to like this drawing or not, okay? And this newsprint is costing me a couple pennies at most, uh, a, a sheet and a, an archival piece of paper that's, you know, really going to be worth doing, um, is worth keeping or worth selling, is going to be several dollars at least a sheet so you know multiplying your operating costs by several hundred um is not something most people are real keen to do and myself especially given that i don't make a bunch um so that's that's one thing and and, and also um it's there's something very very liberating about um not caring, not worrying too much about this sheet of paper and just saying, well, you know, it's just a piece of newsprint. It's just an old sketch. Um, and I, I'm just not concerned if I screw it up and I throw it away. It's, that's not a big deal. I've got, I've thrown away thousands of these, you know, that were, that I was less impressed with than this, um, or just draw on the back or, or something, you know, and it's just, it's not a big deal. And so that, that, releases your mind and lets you feel at ease. Bonnie, hi, Bonnie. Um, that makes you feel at ease with uh, just being free and loose and wild and doing something crazy and, and not worrying about whether or not you're going to screw up this expensive piece of paper or this expensive canvas. Um, and the other thing that I think people, some people are not understanding is that these are old. Uh, you know, all drawings that i'm drawing on they're you know seven eight nine years old so um they're just taking up space and they're not doing anything else so um i i just uh you know i just feel like doing something with them so uh when you're asking like you know why don't you hire a model to do a particular pose or whatever that's uh that's an entirely different project right i do do that but that's an entirely different project Okay. Uh, hi, Bonnie. Great, great process. Thank you. Um, uh, seeing you reminds me of somebody else. Isn't that a fun thing to hear about yourself? Um, Bonnie's my niece on the other side of the family. Um, but on uh, my sister's side of the family, I have four nieces. And two of them are really, really good at making babies. And so uh, I just got a new one today. I got a grand niece uh, named Aubrey. Um, and uh, so that's news. It's especially news because I didn't know the niece in question was even pregnant. That's how much she keeps in touch with her good dear old Uncle Gil. Anyway, here I've got an old sketch. The girl was sitting. She's kind of slumped. Uh, you know, you can't see much of her body. You know, it's just a side-on view. Um, I did a fairly good job with the sketch, but I want to go somewhere and do something with it. So here we go. Are you ready? Here we go. And I'm just going to lighten up some of these things. She's got a really pretty face, and I managed to make her just look a little uh i made her jaw just a little underslung and and made her either brutish looking or or like she's mad or something people stick their jaw out when they're mad and uh so i'm just going to kind of go back over some of this stuff and in particular kind of make her mouth a little bit happier and then I'm going to come backwards just a bit with that chin. 
And already that softens her up and makes her a much more pleasant looking person as she really is in person. Somebody published a, a website, uh, one of the members of my group uh, shared it with the rest of us and brought in, a, I think she even printed it out. Um, it had a list of rules, uh, rules of conduct if you're in a life drawing class, things that you must never, never violate. Um, and uh, Francis, haven't seen you in a while and probably won't see you in a while in person. So it's really nice to see you here. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Oh, oh, rules of conduct for life drawing class. And uh, uh, some of them included never under any conditions talk to the model. Under any circumstances, don't talk to the model ever. Um, and don't attempt to be their friend. Don't attempt to socialize with them outside of the drawing class or whatever. That's totally the wrong environment for that. And, uh, you know, don't try to have a relationship or, you know, be friends or anything like that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, don't talk during class. Don't make jokes during class. Laughter is just thoroughly inappropriate during the during the modeling session. You know, be respectful, be quiet. And uh, oh gosh, what were some of the others? I don't know. Anyways, the the big joke when they when they brought this in was was that we had utterly violated every single rule on the list, all of them. I mean, there were no rules that we had not violated, and and. Uh, and did it pretty much on a on a weekly basis, and and we were all good friends. So this model that we've had working for us many times uh, is a friend, and I'm glad. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, life's too short to not have friends, and uh, yeah, I the the gal that brought the the. Uh, list in actually went to Spain with this model and they, they were went and they spent like a week uh, or more in Spain um, so yeah they're friends there's no point beyond that that's that's it that's all I got I just threw my eraser on the floor. It's part of my good technique that Bonnie was talking about. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to jump right on ahead. I've got other things. There was this model. Uh, model. Uh, there was a, a photograph I had over here on my computer screen with a really cool hairdo, and I've tried to emulate that, and uh, that may be about as close as I get to that. And then I'm just going to put that aside and... Pull up some other stuff like costumes. Got a few costumes. I don't know about you, but I've been eating a lot of junk food because I eat my feelings. So Stellar made me a salad for lunch, which is really good, but. Salads make me burp. So I'm burping. Very special. All right, I'm going to give this girl a sort of a peasant blouse type of type of deal with the really poofy sleeves. I like those poofy sleeves. Done that on a few other drawings, I realize, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, poofy sleeves. Low back. Don't actually know what the girl that that I'm cribbing this costume from is facing forwards, so I'm extrapolating on what the costume looks like in the back. But there's sort of a corseted shape here. I don't think it's really a corset, but kind of a corseted thingy and uh, thingy. That's a thing and. Uh, Mm 
Let's just get a skirt. The reason I'm doing this, because as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing interesting about this this girl's body in, in this sketch. Okay, um, face is all right. The rest of it's just plain boring. And so, um, so I'm just gonna make it go away. Is that's it? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna draw something more interesting. Long dresses, about the only context in which you'll ever see me drawing long dresses is when I've either screwed up the lower half of the body or uh, or it's just not like this. I don't think I screwed it up, but it's just not interesting. And so when I start drawing uh, a dress like this, I'm not really concerned with reality so much i want it to look real okay but i don't necessarily have to go find a photo and lock onto that and draw every single wrinkle and crease uh exactly like i see it in the photo what i'm more concerned about is um is movement lines like this and you know trying to make something move in an interesting way and and keep the the flow, there's a flow that you want to have. You kind of keep that so that the picture stays interesting. So, so why would you have that line? I'm not quite sure. We'll work it out. So, you know, folds of cloth doing whatever. So that kind of thing makes it makes it more interesting to me. And again, that was vine charcoal that erases very, very easily for the most part. Um, now I'm just going to take a a more permanent uh, charcoal block and just really knock it in. So hopefully that resembles a real dress and how a real dress would move, but I'm more concerned with it looking interesting at the moment. Nothing seems to be erasing very well on here. It's a possibility that I've sprayed the paper with uh, fixative, so none of the old stuff is erasing and the new lines um, are sticking better. Fixative uh, has a texture to it that's a a bit like cotton candy if you can look at it under a microscope. And so when you spray it, uh, workable fixative is what I'm talking about, workable fixative, you, you spray it onto this stuff and um, when you've got a lot of material down, a lot of charcoal, a lot of chalk, and it's starting to be slick and things aren't that hearing, you know, you put you put a line down, it just kind of turns to dust and falls away. You just coat the thing with fixative, and um, it locks down what's underneath, and it gives you a surface that's toothy again, just like a brand new sheet of paper. So it's it's kind of like putting up a another transparent layer in Photoshop. Okay, this is this is the old school Photoshop method is to spray it with fixative, uh, and I think I did that before. And so now I'm going to 
try to give her something else that's interesting, such as, um, well, the background. There's got to be something interesting about the background. And uh, not too many surprises here. I've, I've done this before. I've drawn girls out in the forest. And so uh, I'm going to put her out in the forest. And maybe, uh, let's see. Maybe pictures of forest. Ooh, that's cool. That's not forest, but it's cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so you got to be careful with objects that you put and where you put them. Uh, like you don't want a line of a tree coming right off of her nose, you know, or lining straight up with her arm or something like that. That would be uh, really disturbing. Um, I'm getting notifications. Somebody commented and I'm like, oh, you said something about my video, but they're commenting on some other group okay so you don't want to you don't want to do that um so you want to kind of be strategic in where the trees are and you also don't want to be real uniform it's it's hard um but you can accidentally wind up with all your trees looking mechanical like like teeth on a saw blade or something you know it's just like one two three four five you know, and you don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that, you know, they go different directions, you know, if there's a bit of a lean to them um, and that they uh, different thicknesses and they're different widths apart and uh, and different distances away. Like this can be back here a ways, whereas this could be up close. That could be in the middle. This could be like right next to her butt. And things like that and uh somewhat strategic um the the there's gonna be branches branching off it's gonna be branches so um you want to pay attention to that too i mean it's realistic to have them just going everywhere and to an extent that would be a good thing just to have them going all over the place um but you want to make sure again that the that you don't have a branch that leads that creates a line that looks like it's going to go right into her eye or something like that. Even though it doesn't look like a branch is about to hit her in the eye, there's going to be something about that uh, juxtaposition of lines that people aren't going to like. You know, it's going to, it's going to bother them that it has that appearance. So you want to avoid that. So I've got I've got the the dress coming down in the forward foreground. Also, I had all this empty paper down here on the foreground. Um, it's just how it kind of spilled out, you know, when I was sitting there in class and doing that. So it's nice to have something like a dress, something that you can just kind of have tumbling down here and kind of fills up the paper and gives you something interesting. And then I like to stand back and look and, and go, okay, well. Um, figure, lines, lines, you know, they're trees, lines of the dress, lines of the trees. Um, what else can I have with her? Um, one of these pictures, somebody had a basket and I liked that. And maybe, maybe I lost it. Did I lose it? Oh, there we go. There we go. 
she had a basket and uh where do i want to put it? i'll put it over I'll put it back here yeah. 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 Now that's one of those things it's like okay i've had the idea you can't just stick it anywhere though because it's like now you're going to cover up something that you like you know it's like i don't want to cover up that sleeve i don't want to cover up her knee and confuse the the drawing as to what's where the knee is you know and that kind of thing um so I'll put it about right here, I think. All right, so it's in her lap, basically. This basket. I've said a few times that charcoal is a lot more like paint than like a than than like a pencil. Um, a lot of people who draw in charcoal are very frustrated because we've all use pencils we've used pencils our whole lives and uh this looks like a pencil and should behave like a pencil and it does not behave like a pencil and it's very frustrating well it's because it's not a pencil um it, it's in a in a very real sense it's more like a paintbrush than a pencil it's going to be a little bit transparent it's going to build up in layers um Gonna smudge and smear and go all over the place and practically spill it and uh i like that i like that about it if your art supplies are frustrating you it's usually because you're trying to make them behave like something different uh you know you're trying to make charcoal act like a regular pencil or you're trying to make watercolor behave like acrylics or you're trying to make acrylics behave like oils or something like that you know it's usually that you're attempting to do something different brian's here joe is here dorian lens hi dorian lens um i haven't seen you since the last time i painted a mural at chiba hut and that was a couple weeks ago um i don't remember it was a while. I don't imagine any of my murals are still in existence with Chiba Hut. But uh, it's funny, about the closest I've ever come to being a celebrity outside of the sci-fi fantasy convention circuit um, was, I, I don't know, it was some someplace and somebody was looking at my sketchbook or something and they said, have you ever done anything that I might have seen? And I said, uh, you ever been over there to Chiba Hut? And he's, oh yeah, I love that place. And I said, okay, I've done the murals in there. And he goes, oh, no way. And then he ran and got his friends and everybody came over. You did the murals at Chiba Hut. It was amazing. We were really impressed with that. Again, it's like paint. Cover it right up, block it out, turn it into something else entirely. I love it. It's great stuff. I put some flowers in her basket.
something that uh, can do two things. It can carve out the background a little bit, and it can also uh, create a, a kind of a mystical sense of atmosphere. Carve out uh, the figure too. Create a little bit of a mystical sense of atmosphere um, in the background. Let's just take this chalk and and go not everywhere. Just kind of pick pick some places and do a fill. Fill it in. You could create the illusion of uh, fog on the ground. Or, or uh, if I had started at the top and just kind of faded down, it might get the illusion of sunlight dissipating through the leaves or something like that. So it also made that very light spot suddenly look very dark because it's right next to something that is now very white. So it has a cool effect. So I like that. It gives the the background a lot of depth. You know, there's something far, far away, and she's in the foreground. Um, that's still kind of there and there without anything up here. Uh, and that's kind of missing in a lot of my work. I'm not really... Um, I don't think in, in that d dimension too much. I don't think about something in front of my figure. Usually I have the figure and things beside the figure or things behind the figure. And I'll tell you why. And those of you who have heard me explain things on a number of occasions can anticipate the next word that's going to come out of my mouth, which is sign painter. Because what do you do when you paint a sign? You you write you write Chiba Hut, and then you go now that needs something behind it to make it bounce off. You know I've got bright orange lettering. I know what I'll do. I'll put a square of blue behind it, right? And then so you got the blue, and then you got the lettering. Bang bang. And that's generally it. That's generally all that you do. You never really put something out in front of the lettering. The letter is the most important. Um, and if you did put something out in the letter in front of the lettering, it better uh, be sublimated quite a bit. So I don't know what or where. I kind of like it the way it is. It's stable, but I've just had that on my mind. You know that I kind of tend to neglect that you know i could put a tree stump right here or an animal uh you know uh she looks like she could be from narnia you know i could put mr beaver standing down here you know looking at her or uh she's ignoring him if it if it is um so i don't know exactly what i want to do but i could put a thing there and um something i often do is grab my vine charcoal again because it's very soft and easy to get rid of and uh, just kind of go like that um, can you even see that yeah I just kind of made a, a shape you know and again that gives me something to look at and go okay does that interfere with the drawing does it add to the drawing you know compositionally does it does it add to the flow? Does it break the flow? Is that good? Is that bad? Um, and if I'm not sure, uh, I can just put the whole thought aside and start working on something else. So I'm going to come over here and and uh, going to give her some embroidery or brocade or something uh, going on out here in her in her dress, something or this uh, corset thingy. That she's wearing so I'm gonna give her some decorative doodahs and things
when I do that, I start usually with little curly cues or something, and then I kind of go, okay, how do I want to decorate the little curly cues, you know, and so, and I just start adding things to them. Historically, when you find patterns like this, uh, I think usually they weren't doing that. I think usually they were saying, uh, you know, we're a Scottish family and thistle is very important. So they were drawing thistle designs and putting thistle uh, all over the place, you know, or, you know, the English rose or, or something. They were, they were incorporating a, uh, a meaningful thing, a meaningful floral pattern. Which, if I were thinking like that, it could be thistle because um, we have accidentally grown some in the front yard. I think it's thistle. Um, it's certainly very spiny, um, and it uh, it's definitely come up alongside a bunch of sunflowers, uh, which the birds planted out of the, the bird feeder. So uh, there's, there's a tree, there's a bird feeder hanging there, and the birds get in, they dig around, and they make a mess, and there's stuff all over the ground. Other birds eat the stuff on the ground. And uh, sometimes digest it and poop it, you know, right there too. And so, anyway, um, there's some plants popping up that, uh, and some of them are, have been sunflowers. And and then there's this other mysterious plant that I've been watching it grow for a while and going, I don't know if I, it's not one of the regular weeds that we get around here. So it's it's something new. And uh, I don't know, one of the one of the seeds in the mix is, is some kind of a thistle, so I think that's what I got. Kind of cool. Probably just introduced an invasive species that's gonna destroy the world. All right, it has been thirty minutes. Um, I think we made pretty good con uh, progress there. We have not determined what this big round shape is right here. And uh, it may be nothing. I might just wipe it out and go, I don't want anything there. It's just, it's just going to bother me. Um, so I have not I have not decided that yet. And, uh, and it being at the 30 minute mark, I think, um, I think the thing to do is stop. That's the appropriate thing to do. So, uh, so if you want, I'll keep going. I'm not very good at doing the appropriate thing. My model was lit from her front, so most of her body is is actually in shadow, which is another thing that is hard to make interesting. Uh, but I got to make sure that uh, the trees are getting the same kind of light source, and that's a bit of a concern because I have a a sort of shorthand that's in my brain that that just assumes. When I have no other information, uh, it just assumes that the light is up here and shining down. And I tend to put all the shadows over here on the left. Um, it's just a quick and dirty thing that I do without any conscious thought. Um, and all, all artists do it. They, they don't necessarily do it, you know, that direction. But they do, they have a, a you know, a natural reflex thing to do when they're sketching and they just sketch out sketching out of their mind. They put a, an object down. They say, okay, I'm going to do sh some shading. They put the shading in the same spot, the same side all the time. Um, and I do that and pretty much everybody does that. So for me, uh, it's always that way. So I've got to pay attention and realize that, hey, the light's coming from the opposite direction. So don't fall into your natural habit and put the 
shadows on the wrong side, because that'll screw the whole thing up. And then you'll look like you're some guy who thinks he's a graphic designer and he's doing things in Photoshop and he's found various pieces of clip art online and he's cobbled them together into an illustration, but but the figures in the illustration have light sources coming from three different directions and, and they're not to scale and they're not standing straight up and it's just freaking awful. Not that it's a pet peeve of mine. Or anything like that. Photoshop is great. How a lot of people use it is terrible. All right, tree stump. We're going to go tree stump. Does that work? It's kind of leaning away. Maybe it should lean towards her. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that works. I'm not sure I like it. However, I do think I can fix it. So again, if I were using really expensive art paper up until now. And then I had all these ways of, you know, oh, I don't like that, and I scrape it off and I change it or you know, draw over it or whatever. Um, you know, you're fast approaching a point where that nice piece of paper is not a nice piece of paper anymore. And then if you eventually do arrive at a design that you think is really good and you could pursue, um, <laughs> You still got to trace it and put it on a better, on a new sheet of paper that isn't all screwed up. Uh, towards is better. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're, you're still, you've still got the same problem that you had with newsprint, only it cost you 50 times as much. So, um, you know, <laughs> me, me being me, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it, keep it as cheap as possible. Because I'm cheap. And uh, I did a little demo uh, a few weeks back. I don't know precisely which which uh, video it was. We were talking about something. And uh, just kind of came up and I said, oh, here's how you draw animals. And I pulled out another piece of paper and I did little ovals and, and little pear shapes. And pretty much how pretty much how I start everything. It almost looked like a snowman or an ant or something right there for a moment. Um, I'm gonna I'm trying to make an animal that I don't have an example of sitting in front of me. So I don't know what he looks like. Uh, I was trying to draw a squirrel, and uh, it's 
So I gotta hang on. Hang on. I think I can. I can manage this. Sixty pounds of book here. Um, find me a picture of a rodent. Here we go. Yeah. That's a weasel. That's not a rodent. It's uh, something. There's a rabbit. Could make him a rabbit. Certainly has that potential. Holding out for a squirrel. I'm holding out for a squirrel. There's a. Eh, let me get a chipmunk. Um. So. Yeah. Something of that variety here. And Going forward like that, and his tail coming up like that. Yeah. 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 This little chamois cloth, like you wash your car with, um, kind of pulls a lot of the loose dust out. Those of you who wash your car, me, I wait for it to rain. Just pull it out in the driveway and let that take care of it. So my car gets washed about three times a year. So, yeah. The really cool thing is, if you say, Gil, that does not look like a real squirrel at all, I can go, huh, fantasy art. It's fantasy art. It's a Narnian magic squirrel. And uh, there we go. We have done squirrel. And I would do a moose, but there's just not enough room. So uh, yeah, before I before I go, I'm gonna just you know if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So I'm gonna. Just be as heavy-handed as can be. And uh, he's got some whiskers. All right. All right. Uh, that's about it. That's about all I got. Look up Malabar squirrels from India. They're multicolored. I've never heard of that. Going to have to look that up. Um, pretty cool. Yeah, every time you think you know something about the world... Um, Somebody introduces you to a whole chapter of stuff that you're like, I I've never even encountered that. And uh, it's wonderful. 
Um, so I've been on for 43 minutes. I'm sure that's enough. Uh, and it's it's Monday, so um, I'll be back again tomorrow. It's uh, I was on using I was doing two. I was too disorganized to do two today. Is three better? You like three? Um, let me know in the comments, and I will see you later. Thanks for coming.